Hello, this is Linda Cheek and welcome to this presentation on homeopathy. This will be a simple introduction into the science of homeopathy. The more complete presentation is available on a DVD on my website, sevenpillarstotalhealth.com. My other website, doctorsofcourage.org, is information pertaining to the government attacks on innocent doctors today that treat pain. I have several important DVDs available on my website or in production. They are listed here. So let's get started. First, a history lesson. In America, prior to the 1800s, medicine was learned through apprenticeship, as basically all knowledge was transferred. The medical person would teach their trade to their students, and the practice would pass on. This method is time-tested, with the teaching of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle being done in this manner. The practice of medicine in both Europe and North America during the early 19th century is sometimes referred to as heroic medicine because of the extreme measures such as bloodletting, purging, sweating, and blistering employed in an effort to treat diseases. However, these practices often did more harm than good, not based on any real scientific principles, but simply convention. George Washington was a victim of this medicine as they removed half of his blood treating a respiratory infection. Healing disease at that time was actually more in the realm of the herbalists and homeopaths. The term allopathy, meaning other, th other than the disease, was coined by Hahnemann as a derogatory term for conventional medicine. He was pointing out that conventional medicine merely treated symptoms with opposites treating opposites, and believed these methods to be harmful to patients. Conventional doctors noted that, with homeopaths and herbalists growing in popularity, that there were too many doctors and the competition reduced the amount of remuneration that they could receive. So they felt the need to effectively organize. So in 1847, the first session of the organization that would become the American Medical Association, or AMA, was held. They set the standards for MDs. Their goal was to enlist the support of government as a means of regulating the number and qualifications of physicians. But the actual purpose of the law was to limit the number of doctors to increase the remuneration. In other words, it was all about the money not health care. Osteopathic medicine was developed by Andrew Taylor Still, MD, in 1874. Dr. Still concluded that the orthodox medical practices of the times were at best ineffective and at worst harmful. Chiropractic began in the United States in 1895 with founder Daniel David Palmer. He had been treated by Still two years earlier and then formed his own similar theory when he opened his school of chiropractic in 1895. By 1890, 28 states had enacted legislation which required that the practitioner register with the Medical Society and show proof of graduation from medical school. By 1915, only three states did not require a diploma in medicine and an examination to practice medicine. States began to charge non-MDs with practicing medicine without a license. Even D.D. D. Palmer was jailed. So they finally responded with political campaigns of their own and were eventually successful in all 50 states. But I can still remember through the early 2000s that conventional MDs considered chiropractic as quackery. That has changed recently, however, with the failure of conventional medicine to treat conditions involving chronic musculoskeletal pain. So now, more conventional MDs are referring patients to chiropractors if, for no other reason, to, quote, get them out of the office, unquote. Homeopathy and naturopathy, however, have a different philosophy. They have never gotten political to fight the establishment. Their philosophy is... When the patient is ready to heal, he will come. In 1900, 25 homeopathy schools existed, but all schools were closed down by the 1930s because of the works of the AMA. 
But recently, in 2011, the American Medical College of Homeopathy opened its first doctoral program. It is a four-year full-time program with a degree Doctor of Homeopathy, or DH. And this is licensed only in the state of Arizona. So what is homeopathy? Homeopathy was discovered in the late 1700s by Dr. Samuel Hahnemann. Hahnemann was a physician in Germany, but he gave it up out of dislike for the unhealthful, often dangerous treatment practices. He became an interpreter translator. It was while translating a treatise on the Materia Medica that he encountered the use of chicona bark as a treatment for malaria. Now the chicona tree grows in Peru. Its active ingredient is quinine, which is still used as a treatment for malaria today. In trying to investigate its properties, Hahnemann started giving himself doses, and he noticed that it caused malaria-like intermittent fevers. With that, he discovered the concept of homeopathy. That which can produce a set of symptoms in a healthy individual can treat a sick individual with a similar set of symptoms. That is similia similibus curentur, which means let likes be cured by likes. For example, allium sepa, or onion, is used to treat allergy symptoms. Onions in their whole form causes runny nose and weepy eyes, which are characteristics of allergies. So used in homeopathic doses, it treats this problem. Also Ipecac, used in whole form to cause vomiting, treats vomiting homeopathically. The word homeopathy comes from the Greek, homoios meaning similar and pathos meaning suffering. Samuel Hahnemann then became a researcher to the nth degree. His life was dedicated to determining how diseases can be cured, not just treated with harmful heroics. His research is the example to be made for how research should be conducted. Conventional medicine continuously calls homeopathy as non-evidence-based, when in, fact, in effect it is the most evidence-based medicine there is. 60 years of evidence-based research. Conventional medicine is actually non-evidence-based. Nothing about conventional medicine research proves that the medicine cures any disease. In Hahnemann's research, he tested effects of the remedies on healthy subjects not sick. He also tested the effects of toxic substances and through his techniques devised a method of dilution used to create homeopathic remedies. As opposed to modern day research, Hahnemann had no and provided no financial interest in the success of his experiments. And his experiments were valid. Repeat them carefully and accurately and you will find the doctrine confirmed at every step. In 1810 he organized his research into a treatise which he named Organon of Medicine. The definition of Organon is an instrument of thought especially a means of reasoning or a system of logic. I will go over these principles briefly here. They are discussed in more detail in my DVD. Principle number one, the doctrine and therapeutic ideal. The physician's job is to heal gently and permanently in the shortest, safest way according to clear and understandable principles. Principle number two, the role of the physician is to clearly perceive what is to be healed, to know the curative properties of the medication, to act according to clearly defined principles, and to know obstacles to the cure. Principle number three, the totality of symptoms. Observe all the symptoms presented by the patient. It is the disappearance of all of the symptoms that gives evidence of healing. Pr principle number four, control. It is important to control experimentally all that has been found or studied, provided that it is done on a healthy individual. Principle number five, the vital principle. In health, an immaterial vital energy or dynamis, which animates the material part of the human body, rules supreme. 
It is this vital energy, active on its own and present throughout the organism, which feels the effect of the illness. The only cause of illness is the breaking down of the balance of vital energy. Principle number six, the dynamis. The, di the dynamis or vital force causes the material organism to react. The energy in the re remedy acts on the energy on the person in the person and balances the body. Principle number seven, reactivity and terrain. External or pathogenic influences do not make anyone ill. They will only if the organism does not have enough energy to resist. The cause of illness is endogenous. It is the terrain. Equally revolutionary was the homeopathic theory of optimal dosage. Regular physicians believed that if 10 grains of a substance were beneficial, 100 would likely prove 10 times more effective. Hahnemann, on the other hand, argued that extremely attenuated and minute doses were far preferable to stronger ones. Indeed, the more attenuated, the better. Perhaps the most significant contribution of homeopathy, however, and that which in turn contributed heavily to its popularity among the public after its introduction in America in 1825, was its stress on the natural healing powers of the organism itself. Homeopathic physicians were strong proponents of fresh air, sunshine, bed rest, proper diet, and personal hygiene for recuperation in an age when regular medicine regarded these as of little or no value. So from 1825, when it was introduced, to the 1870s, homeopathy, emphasizing minute doses of medicine and the recuperative energies of nature, had substantially altered regular medical therapeutics. Dr. Constantine Herring is aptly called the father of homeopathy in America. He developed Herring's law, that symptoms disappear from within outward, from above downward, from more important to less important organs, and in the reverse order of their appearance. Now today, we have a modern homeopath, Professor George Vitolkas in Greece, and he has founded the International Academy of Classic Homeopathy. He has also created a highly sophisticated computer program, the VES, the practitioner enters the necessary information about the patient and the program helps identify the best remedy for the patient. This program puts classical homeopathy within the reach of practitioners worldwide. Professor Vitolkas's overall vision is the establishment of homeopathy on a worldwide basis. For more information on his schools or research pertaining to homeopathy, go to www.vitolkas.com. At present, Mr. Vitolkas is writing a new homeopathic Materia Medica, Viva, in 16 volumes, including contemporary knowledge and his own experience from the more than 150,000 cases treated at the center in Athens. As for conventional medicine, just because emetics and bloodletting have given way to pharmaceuticals doesn't make it any more scientific or better. There is still no healing of disease or an understanding as to the cause of disease. In general, causes of disease as described by conventional medicine are wrong. For example, heart disease caused by cholesterol, stomach ulcers caused by H. pylori, back pain caused by pressure on nerves. The benefits of homeopathy are that it gets to the cause of disease and heals it. When the right remedy is chosen, healing can occur in a remarkable manner. The principle of homeopathy is that it uses a substance that causes the problem to treat the problem. The substance is diluted down multiple times to achieve various strengths. By diluting the substance, however, you lose the biochemical effects and move to the energetic effects. Now we will look at how homeopathic remedies are made. All kinds of substances, plant, animal, and mineral, are ground up and extracted into water or alcohol or mixed with lactose powder. So then the extracted solution is diluted. 
Let me explain how the dilutions are made. One part of the substance is added to nine parts diluent. This is equal to a one X dilution or one tenth solution. So a two X dilution would be taking the substance already diluted once, the one X, and then taking one part of that solution, adding it to nine more parts diluent. For three X, you would repeat that one more time. So 3x is equal to 1 tenth times 1 tenth times 1 tenth, or 1 1,000th one actual dilution. Diluting one part substance to 100 parts diluent is equal to a 1 CH hundredth dilution. CH is sometimes shortened to C, standing for centesimal. The H refers to Hahnemann method of dilution. So a 200 CH Dilution is made by mixing the substance 1 to 100 200 times. That is the same as 1 to 100 to the 200th power. That is pretty dilute. In fact, it would seem to be as dilute a substance as it could be taken, but it isn't. There is the mill dilution for 1,000. So for a 1 mil dilution, the solvent has been diluted 1 to 100, 1,000 times. A 10 m dilution has been taken 10,000 times, and a CM dilution 100,000 times. Homeopathic products can be found in liquid or granule form. There is another way to make solutions different than the Hahnemannian method. It is called the Korsakovian method, which is abbreviated K. The Korsakovian dilution is a single flask method of dilution. Instead of mixing it, each dilution in a clean flask each time, as in the X, C, and M dilutions, here the flask is emptied of all but the one part substance solution, and then the dilu diluent part is added. There is a major difference between K dilutions and the others. In Korsakovian dilutions, all level of dilution from the 1x to the last dilution are present in the final product at different concentrations, the highest concentrations being those in the middle. This makes Korsakovian dilutions more forgiving when chosen as different energies can cause reaction when one energy might not. Hahnemann was an observer and an experimenter. He noted that solutions that had been shaken through carrying them in a saddlebag on horseback, for example, made them stronger and more effective in treatment. So he developed the principle of succession, or vigorous shaking and instructed that it be utilized in a specific manner when producing homeopathic remedies. Succession causes a release of the energy contained in the molecule of substance. This energy is transferred to the diluent. In Hahnemann's day, he could just observe the effect. Today, we can explain the transfer through electron transfer in the atom. One of the biggest areas that conventional medicine needs to come to terms with is the concept of energy. In spite of the advances in understanding the effects of energy in all other scientific areas, medicine is still in the dark ages. Conventional medicine today depends on the biochemical effects of a medication. And for biochemical effects to take place, the molecular substance has to be present. Because without a molecule of substance, a biochemical reaction cannot take place. And there's the rub. How do you explain action without matter? The big problem with conventional doctors accepting homeopathy as a science is this problem with the absence of matter. You see, 12 CH is the limiting dilution for chemical substance to be present. Dilutions above that cannot contain a single molecule of the original substance, but the effect of the remedy is deeper and stronger. How do you explain that? This can be explained by the remnant wave. 
The energy increases with the level of dilution, like a stone dropped in water. There are two hypotheses to explain the effects of the ultramolecular dose. First, the possibility is a field effect is communicated to the solvent through the formation of polymer chains specific to each individual solute. Then the solute is no longer needed. And second, the energy released from the molecules of the substance must permeate the whole entire solution so that even if the substance is absent, the energy is still present in the solvent. Experiments have been carried out comparing success solutions and solvents alone and the capacitances are different. So how do energy medicines work? Does it really matter? In 2000, when I was at acupuncture training, one of the medical doctors in the audience asked the instructor a question about how acupuncture worked. And then he started a dissertation on nerves. The instructor was pleasant, but got a more and more puzzled look on his face. Finally, he spoke in answer to the question. Me not know. They come, I treat, they get better, they leave. Isn't that really all that is necessary? Can we really understand the healing functions in the body? Let's compare the science in homeopathy versus allopathy. Allopathy uses data from chemistry, bio, microbiology, and physics to determine the disease. But few people actually conform to the specific data. It usually represents a statistical averaging which does not take into consideration individual factors. In homeopathy, though, a diagnosis isn't necessary. The condition in the patient is named by the remedy that will cure it. Allo allopathic therapeutics is based on tole causum, or remove the cause. On this basis, the cause must be identified in order to determine the proper treatment. Homeopathy isn't concerned with identifying the cause, only the remedy that will cure. In allopathy, cause is determined through theories, but the theories are continually changing. That means, then, that the therapy being used is discarded when the, ther ther when the theory changes and new approaches are created. We see that all the time. Yesterday, it was unhealthy for heart disease to consume saturated fats. But now, monounsaturated fats, olive or coconut oil, are believed to be more heart healthy and unsaturated fats add to heart disease, the exact opposite theory. Homeopathic principles have remained stable for 200 years of practice, with simply the new provings being added to the Materia Medica. To determine if the patient is getting better or worse, the allopath would repeat the diagnostic test that he used to identify the disease, and the criteria for recovery is largely objective, quantified fi findings at the physical and functional levels of the patient. I wonder how many patients have gone to the doctor, and after the doctor has done blood work, come back into the room and said, there's nothing wrong with you, when the patient knows that there is. Now, the homeopath will look at the objective findings, but also places great importance on how the patient feels. And Herring's Law gives the homeopath a criterion for monitoring the, monitoring the patient's progress. The allopathic explanation of disease does not in itself make allopathy more scientific. Such models have scientific value only if they prove to have stability when tested against experience. Allopathy uses deductive reasoning, while homeopathy uses inductive. What's the difference? Inductive reasoning involves three steps, obs observation, hypothesis, and experimentation. Deductive reasoning proceeds from abstract axioms through math mathematically rigid logical steps to conclusions. It is resistant to the evidence of experience. 
Homeopathy is based on inductive reasoning. Drug provings illustrate the scientific approach. Today, provings are double-blinded studies, and they confirm the validity and consistency of the earlier provings. There are also some historical comparative clinical studies that prove the effectiveness of homeopathy compared to allopathy. London, in 1854, had a cholera epidemic. London's homeopathic hospital had a 16.4% death rate, while the orthodox hospitals had a 51.8% death rate. In the physical world, we have examples of matter versus energy. It is a small step to extrapolate that, that to the world of medicine, but conventional medical professionals refuse to do it. Now, dynamite is an example of a chemical reaction producing a change. TNT, the ingredient in dynamite, is chemically changed, creating the explosion of the nature of the picture on the right. Structures are rearranged, but the matter is still present. But we have experienced a few examples of an atomic reaction. Only two pounds of fissionable material was present in Little Boy, the nuclear bomb used on Hiroshima, Japan in 1945. But look at the result. Hiroshima was leveled for miles. Matter was completely annihilated. But still, medical professionals don't accept the effect of energy on the body today. If they can't explain something through chemical equation, they ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist, or call it quackery. What is really quackery is allopathic medicine that is based on no tangible or realistic theory, just stopping a normal biological process in the body because they know the chemical steps. The main concept in conventional science the herd instinct. And the herd instinct has brought us to the edge of the cliff. We must reconnoiter our direction and get back on the track medicine was first designed to do. Heal disease. But today, knowledge has made way for money. If you can't make money with it, it isn't worth investigating. And since you can't patent natural remedies, Conventional science ignores the truth and peddles false propaganda that's spread by the pharmaceutical industry and the medical industry. Homeopathy should be allowed to compete with allopathic medicine, with properly trained homeopaths using the practices of Hahnemann and new theorists such as Dr. Gerard Guignot. Homeopathy would win any competition where the goal is healing from disease. Homeopathy must be legalized in every state, but instead the government, through the political lobbying of the conventional medical interests, is making homeopathy harder for people to benefit from. They're probably seeing more people leave conventional medicine and go to natural medicine so that they've come up with this power play using the government. You see, the FTC is soon requiring the statement on homeopathic products to say, one, there is no scientific evidence backing homeopathic health claims, and of course that's false. And two, homeopathic claims are based only on theories from the 1700s that are not accepted by modern medical experts. Now, granted, they're not accepted by modern medical experts in conventional medicine, but the theories and the, the testing does not go way back to the 1700s anymore. This is, again, another false statement. These statements are basically conventional medical lies. Homeopathy is one of the most tested, proven medical sciences available to mankind. But, because it doesn't force anything to happen, but simply gives energetic instruction to the body to allow the body the ability to self-heal, does that make it less scientific than medicines that interfere with the body's natural processes? Of course not. And the effects of a remedy were scientifically determined by what Hahnemann called provings. At first, Hahnemann tested doses of remedies that were undiluted. But he had an interest in the effects of remedies that were poisonous at normal strength. 
so he started diluting them down to find the lowest possible dose that was effective. It was also through experimentation that he discovered the effectiveness of succession on increasing the potency. The scientific basis of his work is that one, he used healthy people to experiment on, not specifically picked out sick people like the studies that are done today. He had them keep a journal of physical conditions, symptoms, and effects of taking the remedy. The subject had to swear the information was correct. Then he interviewed them to verify the data that they had written down. And he finally published his Materia Medica Pura in 1810 after 35 years of experimentation. Hahnemann points out the true effects of conventional medicine that by acting opposite or contrary to the disease process, the body reacts by aggravating the disease. He says, the second mode of treating diseases by medicines is the employment of an agent capable of altering the existing derangement of the health in a contrary manner. Such an employment, as will be readily seen, cannot effect a permanent cure of the disease because the malady must soon afterwards recur, and that in an aggravated degree. This is unbelievably true. And why is it 200 years later and we still haven't figured this out like Hahnemann? For instance, a hand kept long enough in ice cold water after being withdrawn does not remain cold, nor merely assume the temperature of the surrounding atmosphere as a stone would do or even resume the temperature of the rest of the body. No, the colder the water of the bath and the longer it acted on the healthy skin of the hand, the more inflamed and hotter does the latter afterwards become. Therefore, it cannot be hap but happen that a medicine having an action opposite to the symptoms of the disease will reverse the morbid systems but for a very short time plus must soon give place to the antagonism inherent in the living body, which produces an opposite state and is consequently an increased degree of the original disease. So, we give a medication that works opposite to what the problem is, say an antihypertensive, for example, for blood pressure. In the beginning, the blood pressure drops, but the body reacts to the dropping by increasing the factors that raise blood pressure. So after a while, the blood pressure goes back up again in spite of being on the medication, and a second medication is required. This process repeats, and a third medication is added. And this goes on ad nauseum until eventually nothing works, or eventually the person dies from old age. And so here is stated Hahnemann's theory of how to cure disease. A stronger dynamic affection permanently extinguishes the weaker in the living organism, provided the former is similar in kind to the latter. The medicine must have been proved by observations to possess the tendency to develop of itself a state of health similar to the disease in order to be a remedy of permanent efficacy. In other words, provide the body with a weak example of the same condition of the disease. The body will then react to the condition and by doing so completely eradicate the disease. It was obvious that Hahnemann was attacked even in his day by conventional doctors. He says, which of these two opposite modes best describe the name of system of poisoning? The ordinary method, which is conventional medicine, or homeopathy, which by unwearied multiplied experiments shows that only in cases where careful proving shows this medicine to be the only one perfectly suitable. To which of these two modes of practice does the title of thoughtless rash system of poisoning best apply? Of course, the answer is conventional medicine. Now there are currently two camps of homeopaths today. The Unisys believe that there is one remedy, known as the similimum, that will correct all the problems in the body. 
This is the original teaching by Hahnemann. The homeopath goes over the patient's history and characteristics and picks out the one remedy that creates those same characteristics when consumed as the treatment with the expectation that all signs will be returned to normal. A second group, the pluralists, believe in using multiple remedies together at the same time. The pluralist method is the best for today's society, in my opinion. The modern world is now too toxic and the body is too blocked up by toxins for one remedy to work on everything. From this basic understanding of the principles of homeopathy, you can better understand the theory behind homeopathy for the individual terrain. This is the teaching of Dr. Gerard Guignot. Each human being is unique and follows his own path. But he or she shares characteristics with other individuals owing to the terrain. Homeopathy for the individual terrain is a fascinating approach to getting to the cause of disease and impacting a cure. If you are interested in understanding this approach, I recommend that you get my DVD as I go into it on that. There just isn't time to go into it here. It does show how different people are, though, in the expression of disease and why there are so many varied reactions to standard allopathic medications. You see, health is like a bridge. Every person stands in his own space on the bridge, determined by his homeopathic type. The homeopathic type is differentiated by four miasms, four temperaments, three to five constitutional types, an untold number of symptoms possible. Just with the combinations of miasms, temperaments, and constitutional types gives 80 possible combinations. And yet conventional medicine thinks one drug will treat everyone? Of course we know that is false through experience. No two people are in the same spot on the bridge, so how can we think that the same medicine will treat everyone the same? In conclusion, Homeopathy generally always works. If it appears to not be working, the remedy might not be right, or the person has roadblocks to recognize the information. There is a question among allopathics of whether the result of homeopathic treatment is a placebo effect. No. Consider the fact that it works on children, like babies, and animals where there is no placebo effect possible. But is the placebo effect wrong? The placebo effect would show that healing is within the individual. Stimulation by a placebo conveys the message, heal yourself, and the patient does. What's wrong with that? Such findings actually confirm Hahnemann's premise of the existence of the reactive vital force which, given the proper stimulation, can restore equilibrium at the physical, emotional, and mental planes. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope you have learned a little bit about the use and effectiveness of homeopathy in really treating disease to find a cure. I hope you use this information in the advancement of homeopathic principles in your life and in bringing homeopathy back into mainstream medicine. Also, I would like for you to become a prescriber, subscriber to my YouTube presentations and can you continue to learn ways to use homeopathy, cleansing, and other alternative concepts through the seven steps to healing to regain or maintain your health. As a thank you for attending, I am offering a three disc package to you at fantastic savings. You will get homeopathy, the seven steps to healing, and nutrition for healing for only $67. That is getting three valuable DVDs for less than the price of two. Just go on the website to the Homeopathy Combo. Where you play, when you place your order, use coupon code YouTube. So again, thank you for your time, and I wish you good health and good healing.